Hello, and thank you for joining us at the 12th Annual Joining Forces Against Hereditary Cancer Conference on National Previver Day of National Hereditary Cancer Week. We are so excited that we are all able to come together virtually this year. We have over 2,000 registrants for this conference. Thank you for attending our panel discussion on hereditary cancer genetics, risk, and management. The topics covered today are paramount to our community. The power of force improves the lives of millions of individuals and families facing hereditary breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, and endometrial cancers. Our community includes people with a BRCA, ATM, PALV2, CHEP2, and other inherited gene mutations, and those diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. The FORCE mission is accomplished through education, support, advocacy, and research efforts. During and after the conference, please be sure to visit the FORCE resource page, exhibit booth, and our website for expert-reviewed information and access to support programs, including virtual Zoom meetings, peer navigation matching programs, and online message boards. Today, our FORCE staff and FORCE volunteers are waiting for you to network and connect in our networking lounge and in our exhibit booth. My name is Elise Boucher. I'm a member of the FORCE community, and I will be your moderator for this discussion. At this time, I would like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Judy Garber is the Chief of the Division of Cancer Genetics and Prevention at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Garber conducts research in clinical cancer genetics with a special focus in the genetics of breast cancer. She's played a major role in the development of national guidelines in cancer genetics. She's also a leader in research into the characteristics and treatment of triple negative or basal-like breast cancer. Her research focuses on the evaluation of novel agents targeting DNA repair defects in breast cancer including PARP inhibitors for treatment and prevention of breast cancer and other BRCA-associated cancers. Please go back and review Dr. Garber's presentation, Cancer Risk Screening and Prevention for People with BRCA1 and BRCA2 Mutations from earlier uh, this morning. Dr. Bryson Katona is a physician scientist who is an expert in gastrointestinal cancer genetics, and his research program focuses on the diagnosis, risk assessment, management, and biology of hereditary gastrointestinal cancer predisposition syndromes. Dr. Katona serves as the director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Genetics Program and director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Risk Evaluation Program, and is a member of the Cancer Control Program of the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Please attend Dr. Katona's presentation, What's New in Pancreatic Cancer Screening and Prevention, today at 2 p.m. Professor Heather Hampel is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and Associate Director of the Division of Human Genetics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. Her research focuses on Lynch syndrome and universal tumor, tumor screenings for Lynch syndrome. She has over 170 publications on the prevalence of Lynch syndrome among colorectal and endometrial cancer patients, the best testing protocols, cost effectiveness, and referral guidelines for cancer genetics. Please go back and review Professor Hample's Cancer Risk Screening and Prevention for People with Lynch Syndrome session from earlier today. At this time, please type your questions in the chat for our panelists. We have already received so many questions. Thank you for being such an interactive audience. We will try our best to get to all of them. And we also have some previous questions from constituents that we would like to start by answering now. So our first question is very top of mind. And it is, are the COVID vaccines safe for people with inherited mutations? And is there one COVID-19 vaccine safer than the others? And I will hand this over to Dr. Katona first to answer. Okay, well, thank you, Elise. And I'd just like to first take a minute to thank the FORCE and the organizing committee for the invitation to uh, serve on the, the panel today. Um, certainly, I'm sure it will be a very exciting discussion. Um, so very pertinent topic about COVID-19 vaccines. I think that the bottom line is that uh, they, they are safe and they, you know, there's no contraindication by having a hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome to, to receiving them. Uh, the data on the COVID vaccines is, is, is really fantastic. They are incredibly protective. And at this time, there, are, there is no firm recommendation from the CDC or FDA for one vaccine over another. So I think that any, you know, any of the vaccines are, are, are fine. 
Um, and Judy, I'm not sure if you have any other uh, uh, thoughts on that. No, Brent, I agree completely. They're safe, they're effective for everyone. This um, having an inherited cancer risk is no reason not to consider them. Thank you. As mentioned, a very top of mind question. So thank you for answering that very diligently for our constituents. The next question that came in is for you, Dr. Garber. Um, and this constituent says that I am 45 years old. I have a PELV2 mutation. And one doctor I spoke with recommended I remove my ovaries and another recommended that I don't. Why is there disagreement on what to do? What a good question. So I think um, maybe it has something to do with just how much detail someone has studied. PALB2 is a less commonly recognized gene. It was discovered later. There are fewer people who have had it as part of their testing. So we're still learning about this. It's logical that since it is so close to BRCA2, that if there's breast cancer risk, there's also ovarian cancer risk. But in the studies so far, the risk has been smaller. That leaves a lot of room for judgment. That means some people, some doctors will say, no, you know, let's follow you along. Others will say, why take any rest, risk? Think about surgery. They might at least want to look with you. You didn't mention whether you have any family history because what happens in the absence of data is that we all default to the family history and try to use that to guide us. So if you've had relatives with ovarian cancer, particularly if they've been to the younger side where you are, um, that might be a reason to pursue surgery sooner. If there's no ovarian cancer, you might be able to wait until there's more data to make a good decision. Unfortunately, medicine is still an art, um, not always a science, and people do the best they can with the data, but they will have some disagreements at the edges. Excellent, thank you. And we're actually, for our next question, going to kind of take even a step further back because we do have many constituents here with us today that are new to force or new to the fodder diagnosis of being a previvor. Um, so this constituent asks, who can provide a previvor with the best advice for risk reduction? Should they find a specialist? If so, is it an oncologist, a genetic counselor? And please answer for people who live in both areas with high risk counseling centers and those who do not. Heather, I would like to, uh, Professor Hampel, I would like to ask this question of you first. Sure, um, this is a, a tough one. I think that um, sometimes a great place to start is with a local cancer genetic counselor because they'll likely know the doctors in the community that are knowledgeable about hereditary cancer syndromes and who follow many of their other patients who have mutations. And so while the genetic counselor is not likely going to follow you, they will probably know the people in the community who are following their high-risk patients. So I think that's one good place to start. I think the force community is another great place to start because patients will have had experiences with local um, clinics or physicians who um, they have had good experiences with who seem to be more knowledgeable about hereditary cancer syndromes or open to learn. I always say if you're in a small town, you may find a doctor who isn't following anybody else with your condition, but as long as they're willing to learn, um, that's, that's a good sign. Um, and then lastly, some of the professional organizations keep lists of high-risk clinics. So for example, the Collaborative Group of Americas on Inherited GI Cancers, which is a mouthful, but if you Google something like that, it should come up. They have a list of high-risk clinics who do GI, um, but you are going to find those are probably more in larger cities. And I know this question was about not just in large cities where it's a little easier to find these high-risk clinics, but also in, in more rural areas of the country. Excellent. And since you did mention it, I did want to reiterate that in the networking lounge today, um, there are force volunteers that are here from all locations across the United States and abroad, um, and they are here to reach out to you. They will be noted in their bio where they are from and what their mutations are. So if you do have questions, you can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with some other like-minded um, constituents here today. So thank you very much, Professor Hampel. Um, can I add one? Absolutely. Is sometimes if, you, if you're not fortunate enough to live in an area where there's a lot of expertise, sometimes you can work out a, a partnership between an expert that you can see, say, every few years if you're not at the phase of life where you're reevaluating all the time, um, and get someone who can then help work with your own provider if they're willing to help give them a little more expertise and a place to go when questions arise. Excellent. 
Thank you so much. And so I guess the next question is that came from one of our constituents. People want to be able to be empowered in their own life and within their own lifestyle to help to reduce risk. Um, so this constituent is asking, do cancer risk reduction recommendations for the general community apply to hereditary mutation carriers? Things like reducing smoking, reducing alcohol intake, healthful eating, weight management. Why or why not are they applicable? And this is for everybody on the panel. I can uh, I can take a first shot at that one. So, you know, I think um, you know, of course, the the genetic risk is is ultimately going to be the main driver of cancer risk. But I think that anything that you can do to uh, further uh, lower that risk, um, you know, even through all of these interventions that were mentioned, you know, not smoking, you know, minimizing alcohol, eating healthy, exercising, I think those are only going to uh, be beneficial. Um, I think it's unlikely that those interventions are going to be able to change the, the, the intensive screening regimen that, that hereditary people with hereditary cancer predisposition syndromes will need to follow. But, but I certainly think they're helpful because anything that we can do to reduce risk, even if it's only by a modest amount, uh, is certainly uh, uh, an important thing. Excellent, excellent answer. I, don't, I think you covered it all there. Um, so for somebody who is just starting out on this hereditary cancer risk journey, um, this constituent is asking, how do they keep most up to date with the information that is coming out about managing risk? What places should they be going to? Um, and how can they stay abreast of changing guidelines um, as they come out? And this question is for anybody on the panel. Um, maybe Professor Hampel, would you like to start with this one? Sure. So, um... This is challenging, even for those of us who work in the field, <laughs> um, I will say. Um, it's, uh, I was just this morning actually looking at the force page who um, really is keeping quite up to date with the literature. Um, they had a, a review on the PAL B2 page of an article that was just released in July of 2021, which was extremely impressive to me. Um, so I think that there, there are a couple things. One is um, the management guidelines. So we often, many of us follow the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN guidelines for managing our patients who have hereditary cancer syndromes. And they are updated at least once a year, sometimes more than once a year, making it somewhat challenging to keep up with. Um, and if you were seen in genetics many years ago, they could have changed pretty dramatically. So one of the things we do in our clinic is a newsletter um, annually or every other year uh, mixed in with an in-person conference to kind of update people what the current screening guidelines are um, in case there has been a major change and there's a new screening that um, wasn't around when you were originally diagnosed or if something has changed. Um, so, so you can try and get on those kind of newsletter lists, which are, are helpful for staying up on the guidelines. Um, they are uh, publicly available too, but I think they're a little dense reading. So it's probably a little easier also to stay in touch with your genetics team who can update you. Sometimes I'll tell my patients just to put a reminder on their calendar once a year to give me a call or shoot me an email and ask if anything's changed. Um, so I would say between force and your genetics team um, and then getting involved in any kind of update newsletters you can through any of these, uh, any of the clinics or force um, are probably good ways to try and stay up to date. Excellent. Um, the next line of questioning we do have is specifically about testing. So the first constituent has asked, how do I make sure, or I'm sorry, what is the best age for someone who thinks that they may have a hereditary cancer mutation to get tested? What about children of someone who has a hereditary mutation? Dr. Barber, would you like to take this one to start? I'll start, um, but I think, <laughs> you know, it was so easy in the old days when it was only BRCA1 <laughs> and 2, you could cover everything or even that and Lynch syndrome. But now if you listen to Dr. Curian's talk, you'll see that that things are not the same for every gene. So for BRCA1 and 2, where the risk of breast cancer in particular begins to rise in the early 30s, screening has begun at 25. And so many of the guidelines and many of the groups suggest that women consider getting tested at 25 so they'll know whether or shape they should begin annual breast MRIs or whether they're negative, particularly if they come from a family with a known mutation where a negative test is really definitive. For some of the other genes where you might not do anything 
active with the information, start screening, for example, until 30 or 40, when like ATM or check two, you might be able to wait longer. Now, that is if all of your decision is based on doing something about the information. Sometimes people just need to know and they feel like they want to know younger than the guidelines and they want to think about this. And, you know, often, I mean, we're not the genetics police. We talk to people about what they might need, but we try to help them think through the pros and cons of getting tested at different ages. When there's a medical reason, we encourage testing younger. When there's not, people may want to wait a little longer in their lives not to know. You know, uncertainty is often the most challenging thing. But if you look across families, people make their decisions about when to know. So I'm not speaking here to the GI genes, and I don't know whether um, Professor Hempel or Bryson might, might want to speak about Lynch syndrome. Um, I will say that those recommendations do get modified by ages of family history, as we said before. So if you have a family with unusually young cancers or maybe unusually older cancers, that might influence the recommendations for screening and therefore the time of testing. Yes, and, th and thank you so much because that was actually a perfect segue because we did have a specific question come in for you, Dr. Katona, about starting colonoscopies at an earlier age with a BRCA2 mutation and a family history. Can you just speak to a little bit about specific timelines for colonoscopies when there is an inherited mutation? Uh, yeah, certain, certainly, um, but just to uh, uh, follow up a little bit on uh, the, the last point there, you know, there are a few, um, uh, GI and colon cancer related genes that we do test for uh, in childhood. Uh, these are typically associated with uh, more polyposis uh, colon polyp uh, forming syndromes. But, but in general, um, for, for Lynch syndrome, usually we're uh, okay to test uh, after age uh, 18 unless there was uh, potentially a very early onset uh, cancer. Um, as far as the uh, role of colonoscopy in BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, carriers, there's been a lot of controversy uh, in, this, in this area over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Um, and I think all the data now really points towards BRCA1 and 2 carriers possibly having maybe just a slightly increased risk of colorectal cancer, but not high enough of a risk to actually mandate uh, more enhanced or more aggressive colon cancer screening. Uh, we do see a lot of BRCA1 and 2 carriers who are getting overscreened from a colon cancer perspective. And, you know, screening is, of course, good, but there are small risks, risks to screening. And so we don't want to uh, necessarily overscreen if, if not mandated. But I will say that for BRCA1 and 2 carriers, if there's a family history of uh, colon cancer or advanced colon polyps, or you have a personal history of, of colon polyps, uh, then that certainly may shorten your interval and require more aggressive colon cancer screening. However, in that case, it's due to the personal or family history and not necessarily due to the BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Thank you. I just wanted to add one small point. I think all of us also know that people at, in their 20s, they're sometimes thinking about starting families. And another reason that people might be tested has to do with whether they would make decisions about passing on a gene that they might be found to carry, and also whether their partner should be tested if they carry one of these altered genes where there's the possibility that a baby could inherit both and that would cause a particular inherited syndrome that's a much bigger problem for the child. So these are Fanconi anemias. So these things may be discussed if someone is in that age group. Some people would like to come and get counseling about, am I ready to be tested? Is it time for me to be tested or can I wait? Um, other people don't wanna look at Pandora's box till they're, it's, they're ready, but even for men, uh, who are thinking about reproduction, even if they don't need to know for their own medical management, there are times when testing should be done in the 20s or 30s if that's when it's time to have kids. Excellent, thank you. Um, and so that is of course a age group that is thinking about family planning. So thank you to speaking to that. This next constituent was actually tested 15 years ago. So further along in life. And they're wondering if testing has become better, has it evolved? And even though they tested 15 years ago, should they go back and retest now? Um, Professor Hample, can you please speak to this? Yes, yeah, so um, testing has um, dramatically improved, um, I would say, since the, the big point of inflection was around 2013. 
Um, so prior to that, people typically were tested for a single gene or two genes associated with the hereditary cancer syndrome that their family was suspected to have. Now we do um, larger multi-gene panels, um, some as large as 80 plus genes. Um, and so um, if somebody already tested positive 15 years ago, the only reason they would need to repeat testing is if they have a strong family history on the other side of the family, for example. So say their mutations from their mom's side of the family, but their dad's side of the family has a lot of cancer as well, and that hasn't been explained. So they might need to come back in for testing to address that side of the family. Similarly, if there are a lot of cancers on the side of the family with the mutation that don't appear to be explained by the mutation. So multiple people with early onset cancers who test negative for the mutation that's running in the family. That could be a sign there's a second thing going on in the family. Um, but typically people who tested positive 15 years ago, I'm less concerned about repeating the testing than I am for people who tested negative 10, 15 years ago, because that might have been a missed mutation. Um, I, I recall in clinic seeing a, a woman was there with her husband. It was his appointment, actually, but she had a strong family history. Um, she said, don't worry about it. I got tested a few years ago. I was negative for BRCA1 and 2, and there was like four early onset breast cancers. And I said, well, I hate to tell you this. There's a lot of new genes. I, we may need to repeat that. The husband ends up testing negative, but she had a PALB2 mutation that had been missed previously because she had only been tested for BRCA1 and 2. So negatives that were tested prior to 2013, in particular with a strong family history, I think I would strongly recommend to come back in and consider repeat testing with a larger panel. Excellent. And so when speaking to larger panels, this is a question that comes up very often when we do webinars and on our message boards. It's come up again today. Um, and that is if you come back with multiple mutations, how do you calculate your risk? Do you calculate your risk by the mutation that has the highest risk or is there a different way you should be kind of doing that math for yourself? <laughs> Who wants to tackle this? I'll, I'll start. So um, I think that the truth is we don't know. Um, there is some evidence, for example, about people who have both a BRCA1 and a BRCA2 pathogenic variant, because we've been testing for that a lot longer, and that's occurred, um, particularly in um, Ashkenazi Jewish individuals where there's the three founder mutations. And interestingly, it didn't appear that individuals with a mutation in both BRCA1 and 2 had significantly higher risks than one uh, an individual with one or the other. Um, but that may be because they work together in the same pathway, so damaging one or both didn't make it sort of worse. Um, and that may differ when the two genes aren't in the same pathway, for example. So there's no rule or evidence yet to add risks. So what we do is simply screen for all of the cancers involved with both of the genes um, and where they overlap, um, you know, this is again where the art comes in, as Dr. Garber mentioned, but, you know, you don't know that if um, both genes have a breast cancer risk, for example, that that breast cancer risk is necessarily going to be any higher. I would tend to default to the gene that has the higher risk of the two and do the management for that gene. But I'm sure other people may have different ways that, you know, you're also going to look at that family history um, and, and try and um, make a good educated guess about what's going on and what, what the best management is. Excellent. So I think we've, we've gone through a number of questions that are just kind of more broad sweeping questions about um, inherited risk. I think now we can jump into the chat and look through um, some questions that are specific to um, types of inherited mutations. Um, and so this question is actually for you, Dr. Katonia, and I'm gonna do one more plug for um, your session today at 2 p.m. because it specifically asks about pancreatic cancer. This constituent wants to know, does having a prophylactic oophorectomy reduce the risk of pancreatic cancer with a BRCA2 mutation carrier? That's a, a great question. And, and um... And I think pancreatic cancer screening in, in general is, is, is pancreatic cancer risk is an area that's, that's gaining a lot of steam and uh, a lot of uh, uh, research interest. Um, you know, at this point, I don't, you know, to my knowledge, we don't have any uh, uh, strong enough data to show that, that removing the ovaries is going to substantially affect uh, pancreatic cancer risk in BRCA2 carriers. I think that we do need more data on pancreatic cancer risk in BRCA2 carriers um, and, and uh, more data on 
the benefits of screening, which as you mentioned, Belize, I do go through in a little bit more detail in, in, in my talk a little bit, bit later today. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this next question is for you, Dr. Garber, um, and it's from a PALB2 carrier, also a question that we see a lot among our constituents about the use of oral contraceptive and if it's a way to mitigate possible and uncertain ovarian cancer risks. So I'm afraid as you've heard so many times already today, we don't have specific data with which to address this question at this time. You know, a lot of genes and a lot of questions. However, uh, we, they, we have very good data that oral contraceptives reduce ovarian cancer risk for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And given how much BRCA2 and PALB2 are similar, I would be very hopeful that oral contraceptives would also reduce ovarian cancer risk in PALB2. I'm afraid I don't think that the protection is enough to allow someone to forego preventive surgery when the time comes, if that's where they're going with family history and other issues as we discussed earlier today. I don't think this is a permanent long-term risk reduction, but it certainly is something that women can do um, all the time or much of the time um, before those issues come up and try to reduce the, the cancer risk to the extent possible. Thank you. And I do have a, a follow-up question for you here um, from a BRCA1 constituent. Um, they're asking about frequency of screening. And so often the recommendation is mammograms and MRIs. In terms of screening, do they do them together annually? Is the recommendation to do them every six months? How do they kind of stagger their screening methods? So, you know, the early studies actually did put everything together on one day. And part of that was a way to be able to compare how well did they perform? How good were mammograms or MRIs? Did one miss more or the other find more? of different kinds of tumors, and that was quite useful. But over time, people were a little uncomfortable with the idea that we would wait a whole year before examining someone at high risk. And so we've evolved to this set of recommendations that are not based entirely on data, but at least now we have more data having done it this way, that most people recommend that you try and alternate having your mammograms once a year, your MRIs once a year, and something every six months. Um, many people find that a burden. They, you know, I saw a woman yesterday who just is so tired of all this. She's been doing it for 20 years and she wants to know when can she stop and she's only 60, so not yet. Um, but, um, you know, hopefully we'll sort all this out, but I, I'm afraid that's still the answer. And the best I can say is at least it's not a colonoscopy, but I'm not sure that Heather will agree with me. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. This next question is for you, Professor Hampel. Um, and it's from a constituent who has Lynch syndrome and is interested to hear about any new research that has come out about vaccines preventing cancer in those who have Lynch syndrome and if they are available yet. So um, we are all very excited about the potential for vaccines um, for our Lynch syndrome patients that may potentially uh, reduce the risk for cancer or prevent cancer entirely. And vaccines have been such a hot topic this past year and a half with COVID. Um, you know, I think that it, it's top of mind for everybody. Um, there, I'm aware of uh, two vaccines in the works um, that will be opening studies for Lynch syndrome patients within, I would say, the next one to five years. Um, so the first one is a vaccine that's really targeted generally at colorectal cancer, not specifically to Lynch syndrome colorectal cancers. The reason they're going to um, preferentially enroll people with Lynch syndrome is individuals with Lynch syndrome have such a much higher chance of getting precancerous colon polyps or cancer. You can study your outcome a lot faster by enrolling Lynch syndrome patients into a vaccine study, even if it's just for colon cancer in general, um, because it doesn't take as long to see if you're reducing the number of polyps and cancers. Um, so that study may open first, but it is not specific to anything about Lynch syndrome. Um, my concern is that someone who participates in that study may then not be eligible for the next vaccine that should be coming down the road, which is 
specifically targeted to the frame shift proteins that Lynch syndrome tumors make. Um, so that is a vaccine that should work very well in patients with Lynch syndrome and only in patients with Lynch syndrome and is targeted specifically to their tumors. Um, just like if you were in the Pfizer vaccine study, you were probably not eligible for the Moderna vaccine study because nobody would know which worked. So I'm a little concerned that if you're in the generic colon cancer vaccine study, you may not be eligible for the specific Lynch syndrome frame shift peptide protein vaccine study. So just, um, I, I would watch clinicaltrials.gov for these studies. I'm sure FORCE will also be um, publicizing them as soon as they open. Um, and then just think about whether the study is spe a vaccine specific to Lynch syndrome or not, and whether or not you want to wait for one specific to Lynch syndrome or not. Obviously, um, all of this will help future uh, generations, um, maybe prevent colon cancer in general or specifically prevent colon cancer in individuals with Lynch syndrome. So we're very excited about it. And they should be enrolling, I would say, within the next one to five years. Excellent. And so we actually, this is a good segue to a follow-up question here. Um, Andy, sorry, sorry, can I add ahead. one? Uh, yep. I actually ahead. just had one, one more point to uh, what, what Heather was saying is that there's also uh, some work for looking at uh, tumor vaccines uh, in, 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 in the post-diagnosis uh, phase as well. Um, so I know we're currently uh, running a, a study here at Penn looking at individuals with Lynch syndrome who've been diagnosed with colon cancer and actu actually vaccinating them um, to train their immune system to better fight the, the colon cancer that was already diagnosed. So as a treatment? As a treatment, yeah. 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 So they're both potentially as a prevention measure, but then also as, as a potential uh, treatment, treatment measure as well. So it's a really exciting uh, time for um, uh, vaccinations. Yeah, and so we the next question that I was going to segue there because this was a, a question that came in for our constituents and Professor Hample and Dr. Katoni, you could probably follow up here as well. When talking about researchers and when they are doing studies, this constituent was asking about the length of time before a vaccine or a treatment is considered to be approved. How long does that normally take um, when talking about endpoints or just general lengths of studies? Do they vary? Are they similar? Um, what are guidelines? Uh, <laughs> so we're not jumping to answer this because it does vary, um, but they do tend to take much, much longer than you would think. For example, our first work on universal tumor screening for Lynch syndrome um, was published around 2005, um, but it didn't really hit common become commonplace or accepted standard of care for at least 10 to 15 years after that um, because you know there's first phase one studies to even prove if it's safe um, then there are studies to determine the optimal dose and um, duration of the treatment um, that's where the aspirin studies are right now for lynch syndrome in europe so um, they're trying to figure out how much aspirin it takes to uh, lower the risk for colon cancer and how long you need to take it for. Um, and then you move on to further phase studies before it becomes an FDA approved, for example, treatment uh, or prevention option. Um, so those tend to take a long time and, and depends on the endpoints, as you mentioned. Um, often with uh, Lynch syndrome, we choose adenomas or precancerous polyps as the endpoint and not cancer, because if you choose cancer as the endpoint, that could be decades. Um, to get results, but adenomas happen more quickly. So it will depend on the endpoint that you choose as well. Um, and uh, we're starting to look at things that might happen even more frequently than polyps in patients with Lynch syndrome, like a, a deficient mismatch repair crypt in the normal colon, um, which might happen much more frequently. And so that can help shorten the length of time these studies take if you choose an endpoint that happens more frequently. Um, but it will vary depending on what the actual thing being tested is, um, what the endpoints that are chosen are, um, and um, it often takes much longer than any of us uh, would like before these things become readily available to everyone. Excellent, thank you. Um, so there is a portion of our population that is here with us today that has not tested positive for an inherited mutation, but does have a strong family history. Um, Dr. Katona, this specific constituent is asking um, that they have identified pancreatic lesions and cysts, but they don't have an identified inherited mutation. What do you recommend for screening? So that's a, a great question. And, um, you know, 
findings in the pancreas are, are incredibly common. And, um, and so finding uh, cysts, especially, um, where you know, we'll find cysts in potentially 20 to 25% of individuals if you took um, you know, 100 random people off the, off the street and uh, did some sort of imaging of their pancreas. And so um, any lesion of the pancreas may potentially need some, some follow-up independent of uh, any genetic testing or known hereditary cancer predisposition in the family. And so a lot of that is very, very lesion uh, specific. Or, um, and so I would just recommend that individual um, discuss this with whoever had ordered their imaging because likely some additional follow-up will be needed independent of the of, uh, genetic risk. Excellent, thank you. This next question is for you, Dr. Garber, and it's one that's come up multiple times even today. Um, we're finding that a lot of constituents are writing in to say that they have either a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation. They've had their prophylactic double mastectomy, their ovaries and their tubes removed, but they've kept their uterus. Um, are there any screenings and tests they should do annually to make sure that they are not overlooking anything? Oh, what a tough question. So I would say for the good news is that for BRCA2 carriers, really there is so, there, there is no, there are no data that I'm aware of that there's increased risk to the uterus. So I think for BRCA2 carriers, as long as women remember that they have a uterus and that there are any hormones they're taking, unfortunately needs both estrogen and progesterone. I don't know why I say it, unfortunately, maybe just because it does affect breast cancer risk, but if you already have mastectomies, estrogen plus progesterone, all good and nothing to worry about in the uterus. In BRCA1, this risk is very challenging because the risk is there, but it's, it's based on such a small number of cases that it makes you feel uncomfortable that the risk estimate is very precise. So it isn't very precise. And you could argue that with all the data we have, we're very good in general about risk. We're not so great for any individual person at risk. And I think what's happening more and more is that people are talking with their gynecologists and their GYN oncologists saying, you know, I had all this surgery to do everything I could to protect myself from cancer related to my gene. Do I need to have my uterus out too? And fortunately the surgery now can be done in not like the old days, more laparoscopically, the insurance companies aren't so sure they're for this, and that's part of the battle. Um, so I think this is a discussion. It's a small risk, but it's not no risk. And some people over time will decide that they have to do something about this. And others with the full blessing of their doctors will say, you know, it's such a small risk. I just can't stand one more surgery, at least not now, and think about it later. Excellent, thank you. And so. I do wanna make sure that we do address as well, this is a question that has come up twice now here in the chat and it's wonderful that we have this population with us today. Um, this is another one for you, Dr. Garber, and that is I am a BRCA positive man. Are guidelines for screening and recommendations for risk reduction the same as the women in my family? So for men with BRCA mutations, the good news is that your risks are much, much lower of breast cancer, obviously we're not talking about ovary, um, but for male breast cancer, the lifetime risk is less than 10%, usually about 6%, which is half the general population of women's risk. Because of men's anatomy, imaging can be difficult and breast exams may be more sensitive. And I think the main message that I usually give is that men should just remember that breast cancer can happen to men and they shouldn't ignore any lump, even a very tiny one, uh, because that is a possibility, whereas other men have a one in a thousand risk, they don't think about this. Unfortunately, men do, and breast examination makes sense for them. For men who have an unusual amount of breast tissue, not just fatty tissue, but breast tissue, gynecomastia, we call it, um, imaging may play a role. Other people are much more aggressive about this than we are, but that's how we uh, do this, not so much um, screening as long as, not so much imaging. Now remember, prostate cancer rich risk is significant for BRCA2 carriers, and the recommendations are for starting screening earlier at 40. And I'm sure Brian will speak to the pancreas cancer screening issues. Those are equal opportunity cancer and can be for men or women. And Dr. Katona, did you want to add on to that just to discuss briefly 
Um, yeah, so uh, certainly, um, you know, from the pancreatic cancer uh, side, of, side of things, um, you know, if there's, especially if there's a family history of, of pancreatic cancer and either a first degree relative, which would be a, a parent, a sibling or a child or a second degree relative, which would be grandparents or aunts or uncles. Um, you know, those uh, individuals in that case, you know, may potentially be eligible for pancreatic cancer uh, screening down the road. Uh, but pancreatic cancer, even in even this in the setting of BRCA one and two uh, carriers, usually is a later onset cancer, and so usually we don't uh, recommend screening until after age fifty, unless of course there was an early pancreatic cancer in the family. Excellent, thank you. Um, and taking a, a quick switch to treatment options for those who have already been um, diagnosed. This is a question that we have coming from one of our constituents um, where herself and both her brother are being treated um, and they are both using PARP inhibitors, but they are having different experiences with the effectiveness of PARP inhibitors. Dr. Garber, if you could just quickly speak to how different treatments and why different treatments affect or are less effective for um, people within the same family. Sorry, I'm protecting everyone from my dog and her barking. Um, so I, I'm afraid that you know treatment is only determined to some extent in cancers related to these genes by the gene itself. So certainly our patients um, who have mutations in the BRCA genes and then develop a cancer, one of the main drivers of behavior of that tumor is the BRCA alteration and the fact that BRCA is not working properly and that can be exploited by treatment. Um, but the tumors are much more complicated. And part of the way they got to be more complicated was because those BRCA alterations are making it hard for them to fix errors they keep accumulating in their DNA, and they evolve. Some of them evolve and become resistant to the PARP inhibitors um, very specifically. Some do not. I don't think we can predict what will happen. So unfortunately, the good news is that the presence of the BRCA mutation actually makes it possible that these drugs will work and that even downstream some other drugs may work when the PARP inhibitors are no longer effective. But we really can't predict in anybody's tumor, any one tumor, how long or how well these drugs will work. It's a big disappointment. They're so active, but they're not curing anyone yet that we're sure about, although we have some encouraging data in breast cancer. Thank you. And we're going to squeeze in one last question here. We, again, have had so many questions come through. We will try to follow up with you, but continue to watch sessions here today because many of the questions you've already asked will be answered in later sessions. But this last question is for you, Professor Hample. Um, if you can speak to um, this, one constituent is asking about access to care um, and insurance covering care and where there are limitations there. Can you speak to just a couple of resources that you think um, you could point this constituent in the direction of to find, try to find care that would possibly be affordable or steps they can take to mitigate cost? Um, so it depends if we're talking about genetic testing or some of the screening and management issues. Um, I know we also had a question today about how to even get cancer genetic counseling. And the one good thing I can say that came out of COVID is that most cancer genetic counselors are providing services remotely now. Um, so even if you're far away from a, a, a genetics clinic in your state, I would suggest calling them um, because it's very likely that they are now offering televideo appointments and you won't have to actually drive there. Um, I, as to cost, um, uh, for the testing, um, there are many options available. Um, most of our Medicaid patients meet the financial hardship program rules at the commercial laboratories, so the testing is free. Um, the, te the laboratories often have out-of-pocket maximums that are affordable. When it comes to screening, it depends on the screening test. Um, so we get a lot of questions from patients um, who are doing um, colonoscopies every one to two years because they have Lynch syndrome and it's getting coded as a diagnostic procedure and not a screening procedure. And so they're getting uh, big co-pays uh, or co-insurance. Um, and that can be challenging. Um, I, I generally recommend that your gastroenterologist share the NCCN guidelines 
with your insurance company so that they can see that you are simply following uh, the established guidelines for the condition that you have. Um, for things like a breast MRI, which can also be cost prohibitive, there are um, things like the Christina Applegate Foundation, which will actually fund those. Um, so it kind of depends on the specific screening test and what the challenge is, whether uh, it's how it's billed or whether we can go to philanthropic organizations to help get coverage for them, or whether the labs, in fact, may uh, have financial hardship programs. Um, but I, I know people who work in this area sort of know all the tricks. Um, so work with your local genetics team and your high-risk clinic, um, and they will help you to um, get these tests as affordably as possible. Thank you. Well, I think that's a wonderful place to end, and that wraps our Q&A discussion on hereditary cancer genetics, risk, and management. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. We'd also like to take this time to thank our sponsors for bringing this conference and program to you. Without them, we would not be doing this today. So thank you very much. Um, a quick reminder to all attendees to please fill out your post-session surveys to provide us feedback, our speakers feedback, so we know how to continue to evolve our programming. Um, make sure you check out our resource page and all of our exhibits in the exhibitor hall. Um, and while there are many mutations and many cancers, there is just one community, and that is the forest community that supports anyone who is impacted by them. Thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you in further sessions. Thank you.